Why take care? No one can take care of you in the true sense of the term if you don't take care of yourself. Why take care? There's something that we say all the time. A big, great teaching is there. Why take care? So your happiness and your suffering is in your hand. Therefore the Buddha said, self is the protector of the self, no one else can be the protector. And he also said, likewise, self is the enemy of the self, no one else can be the enemy. What is the definition of enemy? Enemy is somebody who harms you, who harms your relatives who harms your property, okay? So because of your wrong way of thinking, you harm yourself. You destroy your health, you destroy your wealth, you destroy because you, if you lead the wrong way of life, you destroy your reputation, you destroy your peace and happiness, so you're enemy to yourself. So therefore, the most of the Buddhist teachings, they always say, the real enemy is not outside, it's inside. Inside. So therefore, with regard to this topic today, karma, the Buddha said, <coughs> do not do anything that is negative. Do perfectly well those that are positive. This is my teaching. Very simple. Do not do anything that is negative. Do perfectly well those that are positive and good. Completely discipline your mind. This is my teaching. In four lines he said, this is my teaching. When he says, do not do anything that is negative, he is saying that do not physically, verbally, mentally do those things which directly, indirectly harms you and harms other sentient beings. Negative means those actions of body, speech and mind which harms you and others directly or indirectly, that's negative. We don't say a particular action negative because it's against Buddhist teaching or not like that. Again, law of nature. Because we all want happiness and peace, so if you destroy somebody's peace and happiness by doing bad things, that's negative. That's improper. Negative here means improper way of life. And if you engage in such wrong ways of life, not only this is described as negative in Buddhist teaching, but also the law of your country, for example, if you steal, you will be imprisoned. If you kill, you will be imprisoned, you see. Even common sense says, so this is nothing surprising, you see. So do not do anything that's negative. For example, when it comes to not to doing negative things to others and doing good things for oneself, how you should do it? Take yourself as an example. Take yourself as an example. You're pretty good enough in trying to get good things for yourself. Or not to do, do bad things for yourself. You try your best, at least you have been trying your best. So you have some idea what is bad, what is good. And for yourself you try your best to do that. But for other people you don't care. That's the problem. So you take yourself as an example, because I don't like this, other people will also not like this. I don't like other people beat me, so therefore if I beat other people, they will also not like it. When some people smile at me, I like, help me, I like, therefore I should also smile, show kindness and help other people. Take one self as an example. So do not do anything because you wanted the long-lasting peace and happiness. If you do negative actions, lead improper way of life, it is harming you and others. 
do the positive things perfectly. So not to do negative actions is good, wonderful, but that's not enough. You also need to do the positive, good actions. Like for example, the trees, this microphone, they are not doing anything negative. That it's, it's not enough. But you should also do the good things. You should also do the good things. And good things, you should do the good things perfectly well. That means when it comes to doing something good, your motivation should be good, your actual practice should be good, your dedication and conclusion should be good. When it comes to doing something bad, you should not have the motivation to do it. Even if you do it, then you should regulate it later on. Do not rejoice at your wrongdoings. So there are precepts, do the good things perfectly well. And the whether you will be able to do that, that is removing negative actions and doing positive actions, whether you will be able to do that or not is very much dependent upon the state of your mind. Therefore, third line he says, completely discipline your mind. This is very important teaching because some people say, when they hear the teaching of the Buddha, then they say, why, why Buddhists are studying so much? Why Buddhists need to do so much reading, so much thinking, you know? Because the essence of Buddha's teaching is to be a kind person. So if you do that just one, you know, one practice, be kind, then why, why are you wasting so much time studying, reflecting, meditating? People think like that. But to, to become good is not easy. To remove negative emotions is not easy. To become good is not easy. It's very much related to the training of mind. So therefore, in the third line, he says, therefore, completely discipline your mind. And this is my teaching. Now, with regard to disciplining the mind, Disciplining the mind does not mean that you force yourself. You do differently than other people, you know. You wear a strange, different robe. This is not the main issue. Okay. Completely discipline the mind means discipline the mind or tame the mind in accordance with reality. So even if you use this word disciplining, we are not talking about discipline that is imposed upon you by an external agent or somebody who has the authority. Okay? That's not the meaning. That's not the meaning. Discipline here means to lead a proper way of life for your own benefit, for your own well-being. So therefore, in the case of the Buddhist practice of morality, it talks about three kinds of ethics, three kinds of morality. The first is called the morality of restraining negative actions. Morality of restraining negative actions. Restrain. Don't do the negative actions. Okay? Then the second, so that, that, that does not have any connotation of discipline imposed upon you, you know. You restrain, you stop doing bad things because it's good for you, it's a proper way of life. Then second, in addition to stopping doing bad things, you should also do good things. Morality of virtuous practices. You do virtuous practices. There is nothing to do, you know, regarding a discipline that is imposed upon you. I can, you can understand that doing good is good. Then third, having stopped doing bad things, having done good things, what is the purpose of stopping bad things and doing good things or virtuous practices? The purpose is to help others. This is the third morality. Helping others is a morality. So that is the concept of Buddhist ethics or Buddhist morality, which you can very well understand. That, that it, it's really talking about a proper way of life rather than observing, observing a particular physical discipline. It's not talking about observing a discipline imposed upon you by an external agent. Clear? Is it clear? So, you need to repeatedly recall this fact that I am the most important thing in terms of getting my long-lasting peace and happiness. You lead a such way of life 
life of integrity, life of knowledge, life of understanding, that you don't become vulnerable in the hands of other people. Most of the time we suffer in relationship and so many other things because we ourselves are not strong. We are gullible. We can't make proper decisions. We just go by the norms of the society. We just go by how things look, how things appear. You see? Even in terms of a marriage, you quickly marry just by seeing the appearance of the person. Oh, he is very handsome. Oh, she is very beautiful. I must get married. Oh, maybe oh, he belongs to a rich family. Oh, she belongs to a rich family. So these are some of the main criteria you very often use for marriage. And you don't take enough time to see whether that person whom you are going to marry, you are not going to marry the wealth, marry wealth. The marriage is between you and that other person. The marriage is not between you and the money. <laughs> okay? The marriage is not your face and his or her face. It's the person. You see? So therefore you need to understand the person. Take time. Take time, take enough time to find out the situation of that person, the mental stability, the character. And then if you're really sure this is a good person, <coughs> that's the most important thing. The wealth, name, fame, these are secondary. In fact, if you go for name and fame and wealth and so much, that will be the source of your main problem. I'm not saying you don't want these things, but you need to be very, very careful how you get these things. These days, everybody expects instant success. We are living in, a, in an age of technology, so everything should be instant, automatic, you see. But Buddhist teaching says there is no automatic enlightenment. <laughs> there is no push button enlightenment. You push the button, like ah, Buddha. Now there are courses, which is seven days course for enlightenment. In America, there are or some other countries. I don't know what they are saying, but anyway, what I'm saying is there is no push button enlightenment. So therefore you need to take time, see the reality, analyze, use your human reasons. It's very important. For example, human beings have a big head, very big head. And I was surprised observing young kids, you know. In the case of human beings, after the birth, the child takes, takes at least six months to just lift the head, not being able to get up. The other animals, some in some cases, after a few minutes they walk, they're able to go. But human beings take such a long time to be able to get up. One reason is because the head is too heavy. <laughs> so which means you have a big brain. So that brain is for thinking. The brain with its intelligence is not, not to create a burden on you. But it is for thinking, for analyzing what is good for you, what is good for others, what is good for you temporarily, what is good for you in the long run. Similarly for others, what is good temporarily and long run. So overall goodness. We are not like animals. The animals cannot think much. So therefore, whoever is powerful, they should victimize the less powerful ones. So unfortunately, human beings are also living like animals today. Whoever is powerful, they always victimize the less powerful. The power may be physical power, the power may be power of wealth, the power may be power of knowledge. So therefore the Buddhist teaching says, if you have power in terms of wealth, health, name and fame, you should rejoice in the sense that you will be able to contribute and help others much more. Not in the sense that you will be able to take advantage of others. See. So therefore, when we talk about this question of karma, 
we are talking about first of all this understanding that you want long lasting peace and happiness and that long lasting peace and happiness primarily is related to your mind as i said earlier to your mind means what you think what you think because it is your mind which which makes you do so many things good bad the order comes from the mind so if your mind is positive one with loving kindness one with compassion one with wisdom then it will give good orders and your action will also be your karma will also be good it will be helping others it's not harming it's compassionate it's loving and so forth it's patient so the karma will be good but if the the mind which gives you the order is dictatorial is negative then the action that you will do also will be negative negative bad so therefore when you talk about buddhist practice or even otherwise even otherwise when you talk about getting that long lasting reliable peace and happiness the most important thing you do is watch your mind watch your mind watch your mind observe observe your mind and see what is what is what what it is planning the mind is something non physical shapeless colorless but it's it it does all the planning the body doesn't have any power the body will simply move according to what the mind dictates so the mind is the boss your mind is your boss not your husband not your wife <coughs> your mind is your boss so your mind being your boss is not the problem the problem is what what kind of mind the mind which is your boss if it is predominantly negative then you are in big trouble it is like a country ruled by dictators when your your mind is ruled by violence when your mind is ruled by self cherishing attitude where you think just about yourself and not about others when your mind is ruled by ignorance then it's sure you will have lot of problems lot of difficulties so when you, when we talk about doing the buddhist practice what we are saying is i will change the leadership i will change the leadership until now because i did not have knowledge so therefore i allowed this bad leaders like ignorance and so forth to rule me but now i know now i know so therefore i will not give chance to this negative emotions to rule me so actually that is i mean we we don't really need so many teachings you know so this is actually now enough now you have enough enough stuff to think about what kind of your mind you need to analyze if your mind is less compassionate more angry less patient more hatred less wisdom more ignorance you're going to get the problem so therefore buddhist practice means to change dharma dharma the sanskrit word dharma means to catch somebody to catch somebody from falling okay for example if you kill somebody you will fall you will fall in the eyes of other people they will say bad women bad men kill somebody murderer you will fall you will fall in the eyes of your family members so when you do this dharma practice it will help you not to kill therefore it will kill you and take you to a higher place this dharma this is the meaning of the sanskrit word dharma the tibetan word that we use for dharma is chu chu this is your tibetan language you know so i was actually thinking you know when somebody some tibetan teachers come to israel they should not only teach dharma but also teach occasionally teach tibetan language 
<laughs> maybe in, in, in one course, maybe 10 variant sentences. It will be interesting, you see. Yes, and it will also help know a lot of Dharma terms. So, Chu, at least you should know this one. Chu. Can you say that? Chu. 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 Yeah, Chu. Very good. So, remember this Chu. So, Chu means change. Change. So, therefore, the Tibetan word Chu means change, which means when you talk about doing religious practice, it's not just going to a temple. It's not just praying, it's changing your mind from the negative to the positive. Now you know the reason why you need to change the mind from the negative to the positive. Because if your mind which is positive, then the, all the orders that the mind will give will be positive and your actions will be positive and that will save you from experiencing sufferings and troubles. So true, changing. I'll tell you a story, interesting story. I think around 14th century, probably, yeah, 14 or 11th century, somewhere. <coughs> there was a great teacher called Dom Damba, Tibetan teacher. He was very famous for mind training. <coughs> so when he was there, he saw another junior monk who was uh, in the temple reading holy scripture what is scripture and this great teacher came to this young man and he said reading holy scripture is very good but it is better you do dharma practice so see look carefully you know listen carefully listen, reading holy scripture is very good but it's better you dharma practice so this young man thought, thought that since a great teacher and because he is making this comment, reading Holy Scripture may be not a Dharma practice. So then he started going around the temple, which the Tibetans do a lot, circumambulating. Then this senior monk, he came and said, going around the temple is very good, but it's better that you do Dharma practice. Then the monk thought, maybe I'm again wrong. Then he said, what should I do? Oh, meditation. So he went inside the temple and started meditating. Sit in a nice posture as we do these days. Then the great teacher came and said, Meditation is very good, but it is better you do Dharma practice. So then the young man was completely lost. He said, on all these occasions when I was reading scripture, when I was going around the temple, when I was meditating, you said that it's good that you do these things, but better to do Dharma practice. So I am completely confused how to do Dharma practice. So please tell me. Then he said, give up grasping to this life. Give up grasping, give up clinging, holding, give up holding to this life. Big statement. Much of the problem suffering that we get today is because of grasping. Too much grasping to yourself. I, me, mine. I, me, mine, all the time. All the time you talk about I, me, and mine, I, me, and mine, I, me, and mine. <laughs> That's your mantra. I, my children, my family, this belongs to me. Yeah, yeah. I did it. I, 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 me, 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 my, 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 I, me, and mine. I, me, and mine. Self, a lot of self references. A famous Indian teacher by the name Chandra Kirti. He's composed a very famous text called <coughs> Entering the Middle Way. So in the beginning of that text, famous text, which is the most text study for many, many years, in the beginning he says, first you, will de first you develop attachment to yourself saying, I. <laughs> then you develop attachment saying, mine belongs to me. And because of this attachment to me and mine, 
you move in the samsara, you get entrapped in the samsara like the rings of bucket in a well, you know. Bucket, you've seen in the villages, they pull water. They pull water from the well. Then there are a lot of bucket, buckets, you know, one after another. He gave this wonderful example. Now, if you look at the nature of these buckets, when they came up, do these buckets hit the wall? Yeah, when you pull, the buckets hit the wall, they get crushed, you know, hurt here and there, you know. But they are not able to come out, they continue to go into the well and suffer continuously, I mean, in a sense. So similarly, we get entrapped in the samsara, like these buckets. Like the buckets hitting the wall and getting crushed. We undergo so many different types of suffering because of this grasping to me and mine. That's what this Buddhist teacher said. Then, a number of years back, I was able to attend a conference, scientific conference, in New York, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, where a scientist based on his scientific research. He also concluded, like the Buddhist teaching, he also, based on his scientific finding, nothing to do with Buddhism, based on his own scientific finding, he said that those people who make a lot of self-references are more prone to all kinds of diseases, including heart attack. Including, including heart attack. Heart attack. Heart failure. Okay. All kind of diseases, including heart attack. Why? Why? Because when you just talk about yourself all the time, your focus becomes very narrow. Tunnel, tunnel vision, I call it. Small focus. So within this small focus, even, even if there is a small suffering, you will see it. Big. You see, because you are thinking only about your suffering. Why of all the people I need to suffer like this? Why I am, why am I have to suffer? You see? Because you are only focusing here. Not about the rest of the world. You may be suffering, but instead of focusing only on your personal suffering, if you look at the sufferings of so many people, there are so many people who are suffering much, much more than you. If you think about those things, then because of your larger mental perspective, your suffering will be reduced. So therefore your mental attitude makes a huge difference in terms of how you fare well in your life, how much you will succeed in your life. So in a way we can say, that if you are encounter, encountering, say, say hundred percent suffering in your life, okay, hundred percent suffering in your life, <coughs> if you are thinking, it may not be true, but if you are thinking, you are experiencing hundred percent suffering, out of this hundred percent suffering, which you thought you are afflicted with, Around 70% of that suffering will not even be suffering. It is your mental projection. Your way of thinking is wrong. Your mind created it. So therefore you thought this is suffering and you are suffering. So this is totally unnecessary suffering. So you can clearly see much of the so-called suffering you thought you are afflicted with, it's your creation. Your wrong ways of thinking it. If you correct that wrong ways of thinking, around 70% of suffering of your life will be gone like this. <coughs> Isn't that good news? <laughs> That's the meaning that your happiness is in your hand. That's the meaning your happiness is in your hand. So around 70% of suffering will be gone like that. You can 
you don't have to go to a psychotherapist or uh, medical treatment, things like that. You can you can remove that. Now that leaves 